So the passage we are reading from this morning, I'm just going to do the first part of it, is in Luke chapter 9. This is a pivotal point in the Gospel of Luke. This is where Jesus shifts uh, gears a little bit. And we will see that here he, uh, well, let me read it for you. He calls the 12 together and he gave them uh, power and authority to cast out demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the coming of the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Don't even take along a walking stick, he instructed them, nor a traveler's bag, nor food, nor money, not even an extra coat. When you enter each village, be a guest only in one home. If the people of the village won't receive your message when you enter it, shake off its dust from your feet and leave. It is a sign that you have abandoned that village to its fate. That's the NIV up there, and I was reading from the New Living here. Um, So today, if we just rewind a little bit, the last few chapters of Luke, and we're, as you can tell, we're going really slowly through Luke. Jesus has been announcing the good news of the kingdom over and over. He's been teaching on the nature of the kingdom of God and um, why it is such good news for everyone who would come. But the other characteristic of these last few chapters, uh, really from chapter five or four or five onwards, is that Jesus uh, demonstrates the kingdom. He's continually modeling the kingdom and his teaching. He's modeling his teaching to his disciples. Uh, in chapter 7 and 8, we read how Jesus uh, healed the centurion servant. We, we, we heard about that. And then raising the widow's son and then pronouncing forgiveness to the woman and then calming a storm and then restoring a demon-possessed man and then raising a dead girl and then healing a sick woman. So for the last few chapters, Jesus has been proclaiming and demonstrating what the kingdom looks like. Jody and I um, sadly were at the airport heading through customs uh, when Narelle's funeral was on the other week. Uh, we watched every minute of it online, and I really thank those that were involved in making that possible. It was a wonderful uh, gathering, and I'm sure many of you experienced the joy of being here for Narelle's funeral. See, we've all, maybe many of us have seen a lot of funerals in our time. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but at funerals, people don't ever really talk about how much a person knew. They don't really talk about how well they could articulate their theology. They don't really say how smart they were or, for that matter, how much stuff they owned. At funerals, people talk about the person they experienced. They talk about the manner of their lives, the way they loved, the way that what they believed got lived, got demonstrated in their lives. We very much saw that with Narell, but very much so that's true for all of us. Yeah, like it's really important to know what we believe. It's really important to have a, a firm foundation in the, in the gospel, but it's equally important that we learn how to demonstrate and live the gospel message. And what I love about this passage is that it gives me clarity about, I guess, life on the road with Jesus. This, this series is called Life in Jesus' Footsteps, and it gives me a little bit of clarity as a, as a follower of Jesus um, beyond the theory of discipleship into a life with Jesus. And I find in this passage a, uh, a cycle taking place, which is a cycle that We live in a cycle of being called and gathered and then prepared and empowered and then sent and scattered, which leads back to again being called back and gathered. And this is the cycle of following Jesus. So today I want to just briefly look at each of those uh, and make some comments about them as we work through the first part of this passage. Firstly, called and gathered. We read when uh, Jesus had called the twelve together. Uh, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, to cure diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sickness. But Jesus called the 12 together. At this point in Luke, Jesus has a core team. He's got 12. He doesn't have an army. He's just got 12. And he takes and he has taken time to pray 
and then individually call each one of those people to follow him. The call on our lives is personal. Jesus calls you. It's personal, but it's not individual. We have a personal call, but not an individual call. And and here he calls the 12 together. He calls them individually, but he calls the 12 together. Um, This week, uh, I've watched a lot of Olympics. Does anyone else watch? Oh, my God, seriously have blown out my, uh, my quota for TV watching, uh, but it's been awesome. Uh, and this, this week, watching any of those team sports, um, and some of them have been just marvellous to watch, uh, there are these crucial points in, in many of those team sports where they pause, they have a timeout, and they come together as a team. They huddle, and the coach says something, or the team captain says something, and then they resume the game. And you see this, and often they do it at really strategic points, perhaps to get the other team uh, out of its uh, rhythm. Sunday, to me, feels a little bit like that. It feels a little bit like how he has called us all individually, and then he calls us together. And, And there are individual calls for every single person in this room, but then there is this common call. And part of that is the call to gather together. We gather together under Jesus and under one mission. It's the beauty of what this is as we gather together. Jesus calls the 12 together because, uh, because he's about to send them out. It's, it's, he's sending them out into the next quarter of the game. He's sending them out into the next transition, really from being observers of what Jesus has been teaching and what Jesus has been demonstrating to what they are going to teach and what they are now going to demonstrate. From observers to ministers, we read, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. So He firstly calls and gathers them, but secondly, He prepares and empowers them when He gathers them. He gathered them to prepare them now to join His work as His apprentices. And with this apprenticeship assignment that he's about to give each one of his disciples, he also gives them, we read, power and authority to deliver, to heal, and to proclaim the good news. Really important that whatever it is that God calls you to, he will give you the power and authority to do it if it's God's call. He uh, is, what does it actually mean? What is Jesus actually giving them? when it says he gave them power and authority. Because we like those words, but what, is, what does that mean? He, uh, I think, is delegating the right and the resources to represent the kingdom of God. He's delegating to them the right and the resources to represent, to, to as we read, to drive out all demons, to heal the sick, and to proclaim The gospel, three things there, which is to say to confront a spiritual brokenness and a spiritual reality, to minister to a broken physical reality, and ultimately to point to a redemptive reality that overcomes and heals it all. I don't claim to fully understand the power and authority that we have as disciples, but three things I do know. I know that it's a gift that we don't earn. Uh, In in Acts 8, Simon the the, uh, sorcerer recognizes this power. And uh, he gets swiftly rebuked when he thinks that this is something that he can buy. You can't buy this. It's not like a, I don't know, a Jim's mowing franchise. You can't buy this power and authority. It's given to you as a gift. Secondly, I know that without... Jesus' power, without the power of the Holy Spirit, then all we are relying on in life is our own resources. And they may be good resources. You might be incredibly talented. You might have great abilities. But they will only take you so far in the kingdom of God. Fruitfulness doesn't come because of your expertise. Fruitfulness comes from abiding in the vine, as we read in John 15, and by Uh, the the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And also, I know that with this power and authority, 
we have great responsibility uh, to handle it in a way that directs the glory to God and not ourselves and that uh, does good to others rather than preference ourselves. This power and authority is to be carefully stewarded uh, for the glory of God and for the flourishing of others because, let's face it, you can abuse spiritual power and authority. So the ministry assignment that has been set and then Jesus gives them power and authority to do that. And then I want you to notice how Jesus then prepares the team before they go out. He prepares them to go back onto the field. And he says, first of all, take nothing for the journey. Uh, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. I think that's a bit rough, personally. I, I like to travel light, but not that light. I mean, uh, why? Like, why does Jesus say this to them before he sends them out? Why does he say, don't take any resources with you? I guess maybe two answers to that. The easy, maybe a more obvious answer is he wants them to stay dependent on him. Uh, disciples had to emulate their rabbi. They were apprentices to a rabbi. They would do what the rabbi did. Did Jesus travel light? I'm pretty sure he did. I think Jesus traveled really light. I'm not sure if Jesus possessed anything at all other than the clothes that he wore. Um, and there is something in that lightness of traveling light in life that fosters dependence and simplicity. The Talmud says that uh, no one is to go into the Temple Mount with staff, shoes, girdle of money or dusty feet. And there is an idea behind this um, in Judaism that when men enter the temple, that they must make it quite clear that they had left everything behind, which was to do with trade uh, or money or, um, or, or work or worldly affairs. For the majority of church history, renouncing worldly possessions and living in simplicity and living uh, for some a monastic or an ascetic life, as I talked about a few weeks ago, was, was actually common practice and celebrated. Yes, it was seen as an elite practice, but it was also celebrated as the, the best way, a way of renouncing life. And, and I think we have something to learn both from what the Talmud says and, and what we've seen in church history um, of leaving behind your temptations to self-reliance, your temptations to self-sufficiency and the unchecked accumulation of stuff because we can easily get caught up in that. I can easily get caught up in that. And instead, to keep it simple, to keep life simple, to travel light depending on him. So I think Jesus is indicating to them in this that that's what they need. But, but maybe also, secondly... I wonder if Jesus is helping them to think about their audience and their context in which they would be ministering. Because back to that rule uh, among the rabbis that, you know, of the day that shunned possessions and the appearance of being engaged in any other business except for the service of the Lord, the disciples were being sent into Jewish towns and Jewish contexts and villages where people understood and trusted the rabbinic way of life and the authority that the rabbis had. And I wonder if Jesus is saying you need to make sure you think contextually as you go. I don't think that means we have to all renounce possessions or all possessions, but um, in the context of Jewish towns and villages Jesus was sending them into, this factored into the credibility of the message, and to some extent it still does, doesn't it? The way that we live, the things that we treasure. I don't think uh, it passes the pub test when we say as followers that we have our heart set on an eternal destiny and an eternal life, yet have all the treasures of this life. I think there's a tension there, and I wonder if sometimes people can see that tension and it doesn't lead to the credibility of the gospel. Jesus then goes on in this little coaching session to say, whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave the town. And then he'll go on to say, if people don't welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And I think here, Jesus is helping them navigate two things. 
He's helping them to navigate acceptance of them and their message and rejection of them and their message. Again, very helpful for us today because we need to navigate acceptance and rejection. Uh, He helped them navigate hospitality, you could say, and inhospitality um, of people. There was uh, certainly Jewish cultural expectation that if uh, a neighbor needed something or a traveler knocks at your door, you will offer gracious hospitality. That was just the cultural norm. So Jesus is saying that when you arrive in a town, as you're going on your mission trip, uh, and someone shows you kindness, someone shows you hospitality, if they are welcoming to you and therefore to your ministry, then stay there. Stay there with them. Don't move on. Stay there until it's time to move. There is certain, certainly uh, customs around an optimistic and generous response of hosts to visitors. I'm not sure if we have that in our culture today in the same way that it is still in the Jewish culture today. And there is also, however, expectations around um, visitors. There was expect- expectations around those who would be guests, of how they should conduct themselves. They should avoid uh, hosts um, having extra work to do because they're staying, um, which is a nice idea. Uh, They should be helpful and respectful, and they should leave before the host leaves the home. So there were rules here about both hosts and guests. And I think Jesus is here, is helping them understand how to minister to people who are open to the gospel. How... Uh, in in a way that honours them, in a way that respects them. If you find someone who is welcoming to you, don't rush on. Be thankful to them and to God for the provision that God has provided through them. But also, Jesus then helps them to think about the the, the opposite of that. If people do not welcome you, Leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Jesus here is helping them to navigate inhospitality. Um, Jesus is preparing them. Remember, he's about to send them out. I'm sure they were kind of like freaking out. And he's preparing them to expect inhospitality to the gospel and to them. He's normalizing resistance or rejection. I think that we expect rejection. I think we've normalized it too, but not in the kind of way that Jesus is here. I think we don't risk the the being sent out very much because we anticipate rejection. We anticipate rejection. That someone is going to have this response rather than the first response. Actually, my hunch is that actually more people, my experience is, not just my hunch, is that more people welcome real conversations about life and faith than what we think. More people, deep down, want to have those conversations with someone, but no one's prepared to do it. Um, And so we are really worried about someone saying no to us. Someone, it affecting maybe the dynamic of our relationship. My hunch is, deep down, people actually want to have those conversations. Uh, I actually think that a no is better than nothing. And nothing is when you don't say anything. A no is when you've said something. And I think a no is better than nothing because a no is at least a person having a choice to say no, and you never know what the spirit is up to long term in a person's life. You don't know the full story. You've just got this one little moment in it. And by, by being open to whatever the spirit of God wants you to do in sharing something of the good news in that moment, you are opening up the opportunity for them to say no or yes. Or yes in a month's time when someone else seems to have just had the same conversation with them. They're going, what's going on here? Uh, Also, a no is better than nothing because no means that you've been faithful and you've been obedient to what the Lord has asked you to do in that moment. Now, there are, you can do it in a really bad way. You can, and, and I think 
we, we need to probably grow in how we communicate uh, in a whimsical way the gospel. That's for another sermon. But I think it is good and necessary to be obedient. And also because in no means you, well, you might need to dust the dust off your feet, off your shoes and move on. Part of me thinks this is a really harsh thing for Jesus to say. It's actually, uh, it, it's in quotations because it's actually, it's, it's actually coming uh, out, out of Jewish custom and out of the Old Testament. Um, it does feel like it's not very loving to dust the dust off your feet and as a testimony against them and move on to the next village. Um, but I think there is a, there's a difference between the long relational journey that you take with a friend or with a family member as you remain a faithful presence in their life and what Jesus is talking about here when someone actually resists you and your message, and you are at that point not responsible for their resistance. And you don't need to get stuck on their resistance. If someone is a clear no, the danger is you get so stuck on their no that you miss the, the yes that's around the corner. You miss the other person that is just ready to have that conversation with you. So Jesus called them. And gathered them, and then he prepared them and empowered them. And then finally we read that he sent them. He sent them out. And they went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. He sent them and scattered them to, to people in homes and in villages. He scattered them to bring the good news of the kingdom, to minister to people. We read to minister to their physical needs to their mental and emotional needs, and to minister to their spiritual needs. The good news speaks to all of them. And I think it's important that Jesus has pointed this out. The gospel addresses fundamental human needs and conditions through concrete human actions done in the power and the authority of the Spirit. To physical needs, to emotional and mental and social needs, and to spiritual needs. So to finish, I want to just focus on proclaiming the good news a little bit longer. Um, proclaiming, which is what Jesus sent them out to do and what he sends us out to do. Yes, it looks like actions. Yes, it looks like good deeds in Jesus' name. But proclaiming is clearly and crucially speaking to that fundamental human need to be spiritually alive to God. And I think that's what we balk at. I, I, I guess what I, I, I see in my own life and what I've experienced over the years is that we, we struggle to just talk about it. Um, I did that big research project last year, surveyed 1,200 Christians around the country uh, and that survey revealed to me lots of things, but one of them was that people are really willing to express their faith at work by showing care and concern for their colleagues. 71% of people responded that that was, that was one of the primary reasons why they could connect their faith with their work, to, to basically be, to, to be nice to the people around them. But only 15% saw work as a place to proactively talk about personal faith. 15%. Now, I understand that many of us work in complex work environments where it is really tricky to actually have conversations about faith. But I also think that maybe we use that to take the pressure off ourselves to talk about Jesus. My hunch is that many of us are really nice but we rarely intentionally talk about the why behind our niceness. We actually give a reason for the hope that we have. And I, I understand there is context and I understand there is timing and I understand there is relational bridges that need to be built. I, I get all of that. Um, but I, I just think that the good news is worth proclaiming. So I've watched, like I said, a lot of Olympics 
this week. And uh, I've had a lot of banter on WhatsApp with all of my American mates who I'm studying with, uh, pointing out that Australia was, up until this morning, ahead of the USA in the gold medal tally, um, explaining to them why we are so great for the size of our country. Uh, And you know, when you win another gold, like the tennis, it's really hard to contain the good news. I had to tell them. (laughs) It's hard to not have a joyful boast in something that's wonderful. But we, we get all coy and politically correct when it comes to the good news that surpasses all those gold medals. Like all those gold medals are great and the stories around them are wonderful. But, but every prize on earth, friends, is nothing compared to Christ. As Paul would say in Philippians 3.14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's, that's the true prize. Is that your true prize? Like above all the accolades and all the, the highs of things that can happen in life, is your good news Jesus Christ? Is, your good, is, is Jesus worth talking about? Jesus sent them to heal, we read, and proclaim. Heal and proclaim. The two go together. They are distinct, but they're connected. And it's not an either or. Proclaiming is so important. And I think for the, for the church and for the generation to come, Will, 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 they have, will we have modelled to them what proclamation looks like? Proclamation is engaging with another person in a conversation about the gospel and Jesus. That's it. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a colleague at work. It could be a stranger even or someone that you strike up a conversation with at a party that you've gone to or on the train. These conversations can take so many forms depending on the person depending on the need, depending on their circumstances. So there is never one size fits all model uh, that, that you can propose for what this looks like. I get nervous when we do create models around this. But Jesus is sending them out to do this. Uh, it might be a person, for example, who is at the end of life. There's a great conversation to have with someone that is near the end of life. It could be a child asking questions about how they can trust the Bible. It could be a friend who doesn't understand why there is so much suffering in the world. It could be a work colleague uh, that just doesn't believe in God, never has. It could be a person feeling alone or depressed or guilty. But it's a conversation that has some element of good news in it. Otherwise, it's not proclamation. So I was thinking about this, well, what does that look like? Because uh, empathy is really nice and empathy is really important in the conversations we have with people. Like really important. I think it's vital. Uh, and, and, and saying I'm praying for you is really nice. And saying well, if there's anything I can do to help, that's really nice. We should do that. And, and there are definitely times to say that and to wait for someone to invite you into more rather than drive the conversation towards their, your agenda. Let them lead. Absolutely. We are to be super sensitive uh, about how we engage with people. And certainly in life, in, in life care and community connect, one of the things we really want to tr- we train our team in, which is why it's so precious to us about how our team interacts with people that come in on a Sunday and how we, we want to honour that is in the way that we make sure that we are thinking well about how we communicate, um, taking their lead uh, and where they're at and being sensitive to their needs. Uh, it's so important that we do that well. But I don't want to say that that's all proclamation. Uh, Those sentiments of I'm praying for you or um, if there's anything I can do to help, they're really nice and we should do them. But they aren't the gospel. They aren't proclaiming the good news. They may be expressions of demonstrating it, but Jesus says heal and proclaim. If I put the good news in plain English, in non-theological terms, I would say that the gospel message includes five or six elements. The plan of God for everyone. 
of a life of relationship and purpose that people can have in Christ. It includes the love and the grace of God in the light of our sin. That's why we need the cross and we need a resurrection in Christ. Of the invitation of God to return and to believe in Jesus. It includes the power of God to transform your life now. That the gospel gives you identity and purpose that you could never have and this world could never offer you. And finally, that there is the, the gospel gives you the hope of God for resurrection life beyond it. All of these things are a part of the, the story of the gospel that you and I are caught up in. They're all components, uh, and individually they're all important. Uh, and the conversation that you might have with someone might touch on one of those things, or maybe two, but they never, I've never had them systematically expressed like that for me in a conversation um, when you share the reason for the hope that you have. But they're all part of God's story and therefore part of our story that we are to proclaim, that Jesus is sending them out to proclaim. I wonder when we talk about proclamation, we talk about being sent out, um, we're, maybe we're more comfortable with being gathered and being prepared, but Jesus wants to send. That's why things like um, our commun community uh, connect, kids connect thing is so important because it's partly about teaching and, and modeling the sending. But how do you feel about being sent to proclaim the good news? <laughs> Just picking up on Ben's wheel, wheel of emotion from last week, which I thought was really great. I wonder how you feel about the whole sharing, proclaiming the good news. Uh, maybe you feel fear. Just you're, you're really afraid of maybe being rejected or afraid of what someone might think. Maybe, maybe uh, you feel guilty because it's like, oh, I can't remember the last time that I actually had that kind of intentional conversation with someone. Maybe you feel um, some shame around that. Maybe you feel angry. Angry uh, because you do it, but it doesn't feel like anybody else seems to care about this thing. Maybe you're angry because it seems like the church doesn't have enough evangelists in it. Or maybe you just feel sad about that. Maybe you're finding opportunities all the time and there's a real joy around this. Or maybe you're on the receiving end of it and you feel hurt. I, I want to acknowledge that there's a whole bunch of emotions that can happen around uh, this area of proclamation. And my experience is that most people... Uh, are general, gen, generally reluctant or anxious about talking about faith to people who don't share it. And I am too sometimes. But, but here's, um, just to close, what I want to encourage you to do. Uh, these are my three Ps. <laughs> Plan, pray, and prep. I think, where do you begin? Plan for proclamation opportunities. Life is not always well planned and we can make plans and the Lord can <laughs> direct us in other ways. But it doesn't hurt to plan for those opportunities. Maybe it's with a loved one. Maybe it's with someone that's unwell. Maybe it's with a child or a neighbor. But plan. Secondly, pray then for courage and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Because like I said before, we want to go empowered uh, um, and in the authority of the Spirit. Not in our own timing or our own effort. And finally, prepare in advance where you can. Think about what you want to say. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Just this week, uh, I visited someone uh, in hospital that doesn't have long to live. You don't know them. Um, they've never been to our church or embraced Christianity as long as I've known them. And I've known them my whole life. Um, they've just not seen a need. They've lived, by all accounts, a great life. But they don't have any relationship with Jesus. And for me, that's, that's not okay. It's, it's not okay. Especially now. Um, because their eternal life matters, doesn't it? I mean, I think that's a big question. Do you actually think someone's eternal life matters? Um, they know I'm a Christian, um, but I've never had a spiritual conversation with them before in all this time. Um, so uh, I planned for an opportunity to go to the hospital this week, organized it with the family, um, 
you know, make, got the right, the appropriate time to go. So I planned by going to the hospital. On the way, I was praying for courage and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And in the car, I rehearsed, and I often do this, I rehearsed out loud what I thought I might say to them. Uh, I find it's really helpful to talk it out, what you might say. Uh, and so, um, without breaking any confidentiality, basically what I did was I expressed my love. I wanted to express my love and respect for them because I've known them my whole life. And they have, by all accounts, lived honorably, and I am so grateful for them. So I wanted to express that. Um, I wanted to connect to what emotions they are feeling. And emotion stuff's really good, really important. It's a really helpful way of um, having a, starting conversations with people that you can talk about emotions with. So connect to what emotions they are feeling, because I suspected that they would be feeling what most people feel at that time in their life, which is fear and sorrow and anxiety. Um, so I was able to ask about that. And then, and then I asked them about hope. Um, and I asked them, do they have any hope? And where does their hope come from? And uh, in that, I was able to convey in that short conversation, the hope is that no matter how much they've ignored or denied or dismissed God in their life, and they would confess that, um, that it's not too late to reach out to him, to trust God for your death, confident that Jesus did rise again and that they can also rise with him. So I was able to share that. And then I, I used the thief on the cross. I just briefly, in like 30 seconds, told this person about the story of the thief on the cross. And then I got to pray with them for their healing and that they might find hope in Jesus. Um, and I'll head back there next week, hopefully, to be continued. Um, it, it, nothing ever goes the way you plan. When I arrived, the, the rest of the family was there too, and so I had more opportunities than I had planned on, uh, and it was beautiful. And um, preparation was absolutely really helpful in that moment. Preparing what you think you'd like to say is so helpful for those times, even if it doesn't go to plan. Um, it helps to be completely led by the Spirit and to be able to truly give the reason for the hope that you have. And uh, I wanted to just remind us about proclamation. This is what Jesus sent the disciples out to do. It's what we are often reluctant to do. And, and you might be thinking, well, that was the disciples. That was, that was their job. It's not my job. <laughs> In the next chapter, Jesus sends out 72. And then when we get to Matthew 28, Jesus says to his disciples, right, you go into the whole world. And you, you baptize them, and then you teach them to obey everything, everything that I commanded. We're all caught up in this. We're all caught up in the same commission. It's a commission uh, of proclaiming. It's a commission of demonstrating the good news. And, and I, I, when I think about what's coming uh, with uh, community uh, Kids Connect, and I just think about our everyday lives, we all have a calling on our lives uh, to be sent. We're about to leave this place now. We're going to be sent out. And I pray that we might be sent out. Um, there is no class of disciples who Jesus just keeps permanently on the bench. He calls and gathers us. He prepares and empowers us. Then he sends and scatters us to demonstrate and communicate the kingdom of God. Interestingly then, if we go to verse 10, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what he had done. Then he took them with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida, where they did get interrupted, but again, return, called and gathered, and then he would send them out again. Let me pray for us. Lord, um, as we conclude this morning, 
as we think about the the immense privilege that it is to be caught up in the gospel as we realize the gift that we've all received, the good news that we have, which is greater than any Olympic medal. Lord, I pray that you would increase our confidence and our boldness um, to give the reasons for the hope that we have. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to pray. I pray that you would help us to, to plan and to prepare for those opportunities that I think will come this week if we would open our hearts and our eyes. Lord, help us. Um, You have called us to make disciples. Um, I pray that as disciples, you you would help us to do that. Lord, we know we all only play a part. It's you that makes people come alive. It's you that brings salvation, but you use us. And it's a joy to be used. May we each embrace that this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I knew we were going to go along this morning, so we won't, we won't, uh, we will, we'll leave it there. But if you would like, maybe if this is something that you're, you are nervous about, this is one of those emotions comes up for you, you'd like to talk about it, or you'd just like me to pray that you would have boldness and courage this week to go into your environment, your context, to share good news, or at least to be ready to share good news, then I would love to pray with you. Thanks, Lara. Thanks, Scott.